Good day, everybody, and welcome to our session today. Today, we're going to be talking about the performance equation. One of my favorite topics to talk about, the performance equation has been around at least for, I'll say, 30 years in my life and uh, longer than that, it was developed by a gentleman by the name of Dr. John Marshall from the Self-Management Group, um, and thus the name, the Self-Management Group. The reason for the performance equation is all about self-management, self-motivation, how to truly understand what I'll say, how to self-manage ourselves and self-motivate ourselves uh, and get away from focusing on results, okay? When we start to focus on performance, and again, I want to talk a little bit about that in the beginning, because a lot of times when you use the word performance, People think about results. Somebody says that that individual has performed well. Generally speaking, they're talking about, I'll say, the results that they produce. There's a challenge and there's an issue when we focus on results from that point of view. And that's simply that we can't control our results. Uh, other people need to, what I'll say, interact with us in a way that we end up having and producing the results that we produce in our life. The thing about performance is we can control, control our performance. Why? Because it's our own performance. Uh, and there's a number of different reasons that you really want to focus on performance, I'll say, that leads to results and not the results. Number one, if we focus on the results and we achieve the results, well, we feel really good and our mindset goes up. If we focus on the result and we don't achieve the result, well, our mindset goes down and we feel pretty crappy. And so what that ultimately ends up doing is building a mindset for us that is dependent on our results. When we're, quote unquote, having good results, our mindset's up. When we're having bad results, our mindset's down. And that puts us on this roller coaster ride of a mindset of constantly up and down, up and down, up and down. When we focus on performance, I'll say that leads to results there can be situations where we've performed extremely well. We've done everything at a very high level from a performance point of view. And for whatever reason, the result just didn't materialize. Whether it's we didn't get the sale from a customer, whether it's we didn't win the game when we performed well as an individual or we performed well as a team. But by understanding that we performed well and we didn't produce the result, it allows us to keep the mindset at a high level. And not only what I'll say at a high level, but at a high stable level. And so then we just look at it going, hey, I performed really well there. What can I do to perform better the next time? Because we can always get better the next time. That's the thing about performance is we can always get better the next time. And it allows us to what I'll say, literally start to create a mindset for ourselves, a belief in ourselves, if you want to call it that, that never escapes us, no matter what the actual circumstances, quote unquote, outcome results are in our life, whether they're in our professional life, whether they're in our personal life from that point of view. Because when we focus on performance, that's our performance. And so we focus on everything that comes to bear with us around us owning our own performance what I'll say, self-managing our own performance, self-motivating our own performance, and therefore taking 100% responsibility. And when you start to do that, man, you start to really influence the results. So I always like to say, it's not about results, it's about performance that leads to results. Because if I perform consistently well at a high level, I very much influence the results in my life at a very high level. If I perform inconsistently, one day my performance is good, one day my performance is bad, well, now I influence the results of my life. Some days they might be good, some days they might be bad. And if I, what I'll say, perform poorly, then I'm influencing my results at a poor level, meaning if I'm influencing or if I'm performing at a low level or if I'm performing at a poor level or not nearly where my, what I'll say, capability is, then I influence the results in a negative fashion or in a poor performance, okay? And when you really start to think about it, what comes first, the performance or the results? Well, it's always the results that come second, the performance that comes first. So let's focus on performance first. And we're gonna even break performance down 
into what I'll say smaller chunks. So we can even focus on smaller chunks that leads to what I'll say the bigger piece when it comes to performance as well too. And the other thing that I like to say about performance, ultimately you start to what I'll say transcend the results that you're producing. Whatever results you're producing in your life now, whatever that discipline is, whether it's a personal discipline, whether it's um, a financial discipline, whether it's a, a, a work professional discipline, whether it's losing weight, whether it's saving money, whether it's reaching a goal, typically when we start to really get engaged in performance, not only do we exceed the level that we're at right now from the results we produce, but we quite frankly smash them. Why? Because we're focusing on something that we can control and we're focusing on controlling ourselves in every situation, regardless of what I'll say the outcome is. So let's bring up the performance equation. Let me just do a few things here. Let me start to share my screen. And we'll bring it up onto the slideshow. There we go. So now everybody can see the performance equation. And it literally is an equation. It's a, it's a mathematical equation. That's one of the reasons why I love the performance equation, because I love math. Um, back in school, I was always really good at math. I love numbers. Some people like words. Some people like numbers. And we're going to talk about that, too. I love numbers. So one of the reasons why I like the performance equation. So think about it this way. If we're going to rate our performance in something, okay, and ultimately what your performance is, it's a combination of your talent in any particular discipline. It's a combination of the habits that you bring to that discipline. And it's a combination of the opportunity that you're applying both your habits and your talents to. And that's ultimately what your performance or what I call your performance coefficient is. So let's just assume for a moment that we're going to rate ourselves on a particular, what I'll say, performance. And on a scale of one to 10, one being low, 10 being high, that we're a one in talent, we're a one in habits, we're a one in opportunity. Our performance coefficient is one, not that great. But if my performing in other areas where my talent's a 10, my habits are a 10, the opportunities at 10, now my performance coefficient is a thousand. On a scale of one to five, would you give yourself a five on achieving what you want in life? If your answer is anything less than a five, right now, I have something awesome for you. Achieving your goals and living your life out of five isn't easy. Most people aren't prepared to focus, stay disciplined, and do the everyday work that is necessary to achieve amazing results. But since you're watching this, then I'm guessing that you're not one of those people. And this is an opportunity that will change your life. Give to Get is a global program that brings together world-class coaching and combines it with empowering masterminds and networking opportunities. We provide five-star guidance for the price of a cup of coffee a day. To find out more, click on the link in the description of this coaching session. You know, which one do you want to really focus on where your performance coefficient is a thousand or where your performance coefficient is a one? Obviously, let's go to the thousand. Where I'm going with that example is the one thing about performance is if you start to increase your talent in any one area, it gives you an inordinate increase in your performance because this is really multiplication, okay? It really duplicates and multiplies what happens on our habit side, what happens on our opportunity side, even if we're just going to bring up the talent a little bit. Or if we really, what I'll say, are focused on the right opportunity, where we might have had great talent, great habits in another area, but the opportunity really didn't fit us from that point of view, and therefore our performance wasn't that great, we simply shift that talent and habits to an opportunity where it fits us a whole lot better, and guess what? Our performance skyrockets from that point of view. And as I said earlier, the key thing about performance is you control it. You're 100% responsible for your own performance. Therefore, you're 100% controllable about every aspect as we break it down. So let's break down exactly what is performance so we understand how it all comes together. Because we talked about how by controlling or by focusing on performance, that can influence our results and the performance comes first. Well, now each one of these areas all come together to really put together our, what I'll say, performance coefficient so that we end up self-managing ourselves and self-motivating ourselves at a higher level. 
The first one is talent. And talent, I like to get broken down into two areas, inherent talent and trainable talent. And what I mean by inherent talent is what's our God-given talent? What's our God-given ability? What are the gifts that we were given? What are the innate talents that we were, what I'll say, given or born with that allow us to do things at an incredibly high level? Okay. One, I just talked about it, mathematics. Okay. Typically, individuals going through school, I'll say children going through grade school, going through high school, they're either really good at mathematics or they're not good at mathematics. They're really good at the English and the language and the arts programs, or they're not. Why? And that's just because of the way our brain's hardwired. Okay. And so for somebody who's what I'll say very good on the analytical side, they're more appropriate to what I'll say be very talented and really catch on with math. Okay. Again, I loved algebra. I loved calculus. I love statistical analysis. I loved all of that because why? I'm very talented in it. Some of you other people might have struggled with algebra, might have struggled with calculus. Why? Uh, one, I'll pick on my oldest daughter for a sec because she struggled with calculus. She had to do calculus at the university level and it was difficult for her, but she got through it. Okay. Where for me, that would have been quite easy. Why? Because I've got more inherent talent there. Now, on the other side, let's go the other way, because when we talk about these inherent talents, okay, and I want everybody to write this down, there are 24 sacred gifts out there. And these 24 sacred gifts, we were all born with from that point of view. And the more that we start to explore really what gifts we have and where our talent level is, the more that we can then put ourselves into these situations where we've got this inherent talent. Because with the inherent talent, it allows us to do things at an incredibly high level that doesn't feel like it's hard work for us. Why? Because we have inherent talent, okay? I just talked about my, my daughter from that point of view on the calculus side, which is not an inherent talent for her. Mathematics is not an inherent talent. One of these sacred gifts is the gift of healing. Well, my daughter's a nurse. My daughter absolutely has the gift of healing. So when she's doing her nursing from that point of view, she's absolutely in her talent level inherently. It was God who gave it to her from that point of view. And when she's actually nursing and working with, in this case, the children that she works with, because she works at the Stollery Hospital out here in Edmonton, which is the children's hospital, she's right on purpose working with those children. Why? Because she has the gift of healing. And the gift of healing comes out in two areas. It comes out both physically in terms of physical healing, but it also comes out in terms of what I'll say mental healing as well, too. And she's very good on both sides that way with, quote unquote, her patients. It was actually quite funny when she was going through her education to become a nurse because she was concerned about her marks. She didn't think that her marks were good enough. She didn't think that her marks were high enough from that point of view. And she didn't think that she was going to, quote unquote, get a nursing job and be a good nurse. What was really interesting is I kept on saying to her, sweetie, because that's my nickname for her, is when you're bedside you're by your uh, by your patients, they're not going to ask you what mark you got on what course. They're going to you know measure your success. They're going to measure your performance based on the level of quality and care that you have for your patients. And again, because she's got this inherent talent there, it comes out at an exponential level. Where I'm going with this is if you're talented in any one of these inherent areas, and these are one of your gifts from that perspective, any kind of training you apply to it, you're going to have amazing results coming out of it because it is the inherent talent. And then the training on it is just going to what I'll say, amplify it tenfold. Um, I'm just going to stand up for a moment to people just because I'm still going through my rehab on my, my knee and my knee's a little locked out right now. So I'm going to move the screen a little bit this way as we talk about the performance equation. So another one is a gift of teaching. Okay. There are some amazing teachers out there in our school systems who have the gift of teaching. Why are they amazing? Because they're on purpose when they're teaching because they have that inherent gift in them. There's some other teachers in our system who do not have the gift of teaching. And, well, they're not that good of teachers. 
Okay, I'm not speaking poorly about them from that point of view. It's just that they're not inherent with it. And so therefore, when they go through the same kind of training as somebody who has the gift of teaching from that point of view, they don't get as much out of the training. And I'll use an analogy there too, getting back to myself, and then we'll talk about some other ones too, is athletically, I'm inherently talented. I've got a pretty good at inherent athletic skills, played football to a high level from that point of view. And so anything athletic, if you're going to give me some training in it, if you're going to give me some instruction in it, I can get really good from what I'll say, a talent point of view. So let's assume that you wanted to give me six hours of training in tennis, because I wanted to go down to the local tennis area and play some tennis, okay? Six hours of instruction for me in tennis, I could get to become a pretty good tennis player. Why? Because I've got high inherent athletic ability. Now, I would never really do that because I don't really like the game of tennis. So I'd never go invest those six hours. Now, on the flip side, I've always loved the idea of playing a musical instrument and particularly the saxophone from that point of view. But I learned early on, I don't have the gift of music. So again, can I go take the same six hours of instruction in learning how to play the saxophone? I absolutely could. And would I be better after the six hours than before from a talent point of view? Absolutely, I would. But my growth in my talent there would be very limited given my growth in my athletic ability from that point of view. And so the question is, how much do I really want to learn how to play the saxophone? Because, well, if I want to get really good at it, six hours might not be enough. I might have to invest 600 hours to get there, where six hours in tennis gets me to that, what I'll say, high level, or six hours, quite frankly, in anything athletic. And let's go back to that even. The gift of music. The gift of music is one of these sacred gifts. And this is where we see people on uh, Americans uh, Got Talent or American Idol or Canadian Got Talent, where these little five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old come on and they sing, they play the violin, they sing opera like they've been singing for 25 years. Why? Because they have the gift of music. OK, and so just by standing in their gift and then applying even some training to it, they get a tremendous area. So when it comes to your performance and you're wanting to perform, I'll say, in a particular discipline, whether that be personal, whether that be what I'll say, uh, professional, whether that be health related, whether that be emotionally related, you know, you got to ask yourself, do I have high inherent talent there? And if I do, what's going to come out of it when I, what I'll say, apply training to it? Because if you take high inherent talent and you apply training to it, i.e. you're doing it over and over and over again, going through the training, now you become very skilled. Okay. Again, my daughter is very skilled, if you want to call it that, at putting in an IV. Why? Because she's got high inherent talent in the realm of healing and nursing, and she's now applied her training. So even literally from that point of view, whenever there's a very difficult IV to put into one of the children on the floor, who do they typically ask? Kaisa. Why? Because she's an expert at putting in intravenous or putting in IVs. Why? Because she's got inherent talent and she's trained at it. So now she's very skilled and she's an expert at it. Okay. Likewise, I'll, I'll reference my son, who's a firefighter, and one of the things that he's very skilled at now, because he's got high inherent talent and he's trained, is auto extrication, where the firefighters come with the jaws of life, and they cut people out of cars. Now, Eric actually goes and trains other people and other people who want to get certified in this. Why? Because he's very skilled. How did he get skilled? High inherent talent very trainable. Okay. The other, again, speaking of my son, I like to talk about my children. He has the gift of craftsmanship. And even with that, which means the gift of craftsmanship is around what I'll say, both form and function or beauty and function. And Eric has the gift of craftsmanship, particularly when he's working with anything with wood. He's got the gift of craftsmanship when he works with, I'll say, stone, 
but it doesn't come out nearly as much as somebody who has, or, or as he works with wood. So when you think about somebody with the gift of craftsmanship, it can be a dentist, it can be a surgeon, it can be a florist who makes these beautiful florist arrangements. It can be an artist who paints these beautiful pictures. It can be a quilter who makes these beautiful quilts. Okay. So where I'm going with this is we want to start to put ourselves into situations, opportunities, things to where we can perform at a very high level. So I want you to start to do some work to say, what are the inherent talents that I have? What were the God-given talents that I were born with? And if you want to Google this program, 24 Sacred Gifts, and go through all the sacred gifts and start to ask yourself, do I have this gift? Because if you do and you apply what I'll say training to it, you're going to become very skilled, which means now your talent level is getting up to that 10 out of 10. And that helps you perform at an incredibly high level. Next over is what are the habits that we bring to, quote unquote, our talent on a daily basis? And when I talk about habits, I like to break those into two as well, too. Habit of thought, that's your attitude. So what is the attitude? What's the habitual attitude that you're having each and every day at a very high level? Some say positive, some say negative, some say optimistic, some say pessimistic, okay? But in terms of the attitude, what are the thoughts that you're creating each and every day that are developing your attitude? that are then coming into what I'll say your habitual being each and every day so that that attitude just shows up each and every day as a habit. And what are the, what I'll say, behaviors that ultimately comes out as your efforts that are helping you be successful each and every day? And these are where I like to talk about success habits. Because if you look at people that are highly successful in any discipline, whether it be professional athletics, whether it be banking, whether it be sales, whether it be doctors, whether it be nurses, from that point of view, look at anybody highly successful there, you'll typically find that they have four to five, five to six, what I'll say, habits that they do each and every day. And it's because of those habits that what I'll say brings this level of effort and attitude that helps them perform at a very high level, and they're consistently doing it each and every day. Why? Because they've developed it into a habit. So now it's happening at a habitual level. And the reason why I say four or five, five or six, because that's typically what it is, okay? We don't need 25 habits to be successful and perform at a very high level. And again, they get very, quote unquote, skilled at these habits, okay? So I always like to challenge people and say, what are your four or five key success habits from that perspective? Seven habits of highly effective people. That's it. Like literally you could take those seven habits, okay, and put them in. Um, one, I've read that book many, many times and, and I absolutely love that book. Let's go there as one of the habits right now. Okay, habit number six. First seek to understand, then seek to be understood. Rather than always wanting people to understand you, or said differently, if you truly want to get people to understand you, develop the habit of understanding other people first, okay? That's actually an attitude. If I, if I develop the attitude that I always want to understand people first, then my effort is naturally going to go and do that. And I'm going to be more empathetic. I'm going to listen at a higher level. And I'm going to be more effective from that point of view. And, and so you want to start to ask yourself, what are the six or the four or five, five or six key success habits that you want in your life that are going to, what I'll say, bring the level of performance you want to, quote unquote, perform at the level you want to achieve the results that you want and have the success that you want. One of the ones for me, and I'll just put it out there right now for me, is being punctual. Being punctual is incredibly important to me. And when I say being punctual, that's, be, that's showing up on time for everything in your life. Whether that's getting a paper done on time, whether that's an appointment, whether that's meeting a deadline from that point of view, okay, is punctuality is incredibly important to me. And so from that point of view, I'm not going to hang around people that are going to be 
habitually what I'll say late or tardy. I'm going to hang around people that are going to be punctual. And it's one of my success habits that I know helps me build that attitude that I'm always going to be on time. I'm always going to get things done. And when I say always, you know, high 99%. Is there the odd time that something happens? Yes, it does. That's life from that point of view. But I know that I can, what I'll say, have built that habit of punctuality so that I can stand on it when I go perform. It's a way of me self-managing myself to always be on time. So you want to start to ask yourself, what are the attitudes that I want that are going to lead my performance to a high level? What are the efforts that I want from that point of view that are going to lead me to? Um, there's a famous quote out there by Derek Jeter that said, you know, some people may be more talented than you, but there's no excuse for anybody outworking you. And that was, that was literally Derek Jeter's, what I'll say, motto when he played for the Yankees. And if anybody knows Derek Jeter, one, he had an amazing career. He leads the Yankees in many, many different statistics. One of the ones that he leads is games played. He played 2,747 games for the New York Yankees. And I can tell you that on each and every night of those 2,747 games, he was the hardest working player on the field. Why? Because he developed that habit. And you simply had to watch Derek Jeter and watch his hustle and watch his hard work to know he was absolutely the hardest working person out there. Why? Because he established it as a habit. And this is the wonderful thing about a habit is once we establish it, it shows up every day. We don't even have to think about it. Because here's the interesting thing. What takes more time? What takes more effort? Developing a good habit or developing a bad habit? Well, the answer is it takes the same amount of time. It takes the same amount of time to create a good habit as it does to create a bad habit. Why don't we get intentional with the habits we want and get focused on creating, quote unquote, a good habit, not a bad habit? The other question that I always like to ask when we talk about habits and it relates to performance is what does take more effort to develop a new habit or to break an old habit? Well, it takes a significant amount of more energy to break an old habit. And it's about eight times the effort, okay? It takes eight times the effort to break an old habit, and it takes what I'll say one-eighth of that effort to what I'll say create a new effort. And so a lot of people, I'll say, set themselves up for failure because what they're wanting to do is try to break old habits, okay? Some people want to, I'll say, stop eating French fries. So they say to themselves, I'm going to stop eating French fries. And so they say them to themselves over and over again, I'm going to stop eating French fries because they're trying to break the habit of eating French fries. Well, what's the last thing that's going through your mind? I got to stop eating French fries. Got to stop eating French fries. Got to stop eating French fries. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to go eat a French fry because that's just what's in your head. Rather than trying to break the habit of eating French fries, replace it with a new habit of eating carrots. And so instead of saying, I can't eat French fries, I can't eat French fries, start saying, I'm going to eat carrots, I'm going to eat carrots, I'm going to eat carrots. It's a much easier habit to develop. And eventually, you'll find yourself eating a whole lot more carrots and eating a whole lot less, what I'll say, French fries. Again, driving this whole thing is to performance. The last piece is what we call the opportunity piece, which is really, I'll say, the career, the job, the function that you're applying this to. It can be personal. It can be what I'll say um, professional. And the other is, again, I like to say the environment. The environment that you've created for yourself, because environment is very powerful. Okay. We see this all the time in what I'll say. Uh, professional athletics, and and I've seen it many times in my career, where a salesperson will go from one company to the other, and they were struggling in one company, they went to another company, and all of a sudden, they, their sales lit it up. Their talent was the same, their habits were the same. They didn't fit in that other company because they didn't fit the culture, they didn't fit the environment. We've seen it many times, again, in sports where a person gets traded from one team to the other. And both ways. In one case, they're not scoring a lot of goals, for argument's sake, if they're playing hockey, and they go to another team, and all of a sudden, they're lighting it up. Why? 
because they fit better in that team, they fit better in that culture than the one they came from. Likewise, somebody who is, what I'll say, performing at a high level and scoring a lot of goals, they might get traded to another team and they don't fit that other team. And all of a sudden, their performance has gone down. Okay. Again, I say that, that the performance has gone down because that's the culture of the team. But ultimately, again, you can control your own environment. Okay. You make the decision how much sleep you get in the day. You make the decision how much food you eat in a day. You make the decision how much you work out. You make the decision how much you read. You make the decision how much TV you watch from that point of view. Both of those go to your habit and they go to what environment are you creating? Okay. I said to all of my kids growing up, if you want to be a leader, you better be a reader, okay? Simply by reading 10 pages a day, you're going to create a wonderful habit for yourself, but you're also going to create an environment for yourself that will help you perform at an exceptionally high level. Why? Because you're always just creating that environment for yourself on purpose by design. Again, let's talk about environment from a perspective of What's your morning routine? Okay, I know a lot of people that roll out of bed and the very first thing of their morning routine is to look at their Facebook page or look at their Instagram page or look at their emails even before they get up and go take a pee. You know, a a big part of your, what I'll say, environment is what morning routine are you setting yourself up for for success? What's your evening routine, i.e. winding down and getting ready for bed so that you're in the best possible position to have a good night's sleep. Why? Because sleep is what I'll say investing into you, which is your asset, which is your body, because there's so many of us these days that are walking around that are absolutely sleep deprived. Well, we need to start to understand that if we really truly want to get a good sleep, we need to start to wind our mind down and wind our bodies down and wind our routine down at least two hours before going to bed. The other thing is if you're eating inside of three or four hours before going to bed, that's going to affect your sleep. If you have alcohol inside of two or three hours before going to sleep, that's going to affect your sleep. Because when it comes to what I'll say, quality of sleep, yes, we need quantity. Generally speaking, six is the bare minimum. Typically, you know, anywhere from six to eight is a good night's sleep from that point of view. But it's not only the quantity of sleep, we need the quality of sleep. We need those REM, what I'll say, delta waves that literally regenerate our mind and what I'll say, clear out our mind and detoxify our mind each and every day so that we can think at a higher level. That's your REM. And you're wanting at least about, I'll say, 15 to 20% of your sleep coming from your REM and getting really good quality REM. The other is the delta waves on your deep sleep. That's where you're really into that deep sleep. And that we want about what I'll say almost 25 to 30% of our sleep because that's what renews our creativity. And so again, when we talk about performing, what routine are we building for ourselves in the morning? What routine are we building ourselves in the evening? What does our ideal daily uh, day look like that allows us to perform at a very high level? Okay. Uh, Emails. I used to do best mindset. I know Martina's on the call today and I used to run the best mindset. Martina was there. And I always used to talk to people about, you know, one of the biggest performance killers, one of the biggest time wasters in our day is answering our emails. Why? Because it distracts us too, because we typically do it all day long instead of doing it at set times. And we've got another there. Yes, Martina's saying yes. Um, and so I would always, what I'll say, coach, work, um, guide, mentor, the people in the best mindset, answer your emails the very first thing in the morning and then the very last thing in the afternoon or evening before you finish work. And literally let people know that when they email you, unless it's an emergency, you're not going to get back to them right away you're going to respond at the next time you get your emails. So if somebody emails you after you've done your first emails in the morning, they'll know they won't be, you won't be active them to the end of the day. And actually Kathy Noble, who's one of the ladies who was in best mindset, and she's just coming into the get, to give the get the program too. Um, she took it one step further where 
if you were to email her after she did her emails in the morning, she'd literally say, I only check my emails twice a day. If this is an emergency, call me or text me. If it's not an emergency, I'll respond at the end of the day. And guess what happened? Her performance went up. By her performance going up, her results go up. By her results going up, her success goes up. And so even from that point of view, you want to start to create an environment for yourself that's going to allow you to what I'll say, perform at an incredibly high level. Okay. I have my playlist. I have my set playlist. It's my music. It's my music because I picked it out specifically. When I go to listen to my music, I will only listen to the music that I want to listen to. Why? Because it gets me into the energy zone. It gets me into the motivation zone. It gets me into the mindset zone that I want that's going to perform at an incredibly high level. Okay. And then when you look at what I'll say, your job or your function, and again, this can apply to something personally. It can be your workout routine. It can be how you clean the house from that point of view. It can be any of the tasks that you do. Again, how do you set that task up to where it works for you? Here we're talking about system structure processes. How do you take a particular task? How do you take your job and build processes around it? By building processes around it, and then again, here's where the talent comes in. I'm highly skilled. Now I can follow that process and become a subject matter expert at an incredibly high level around cleaning a house, around making wine, around working out. Okay. I've seen some people go in the gym and they literally have spent two hours there and hardly got a workout. I've seen other people come in and they are in and out in 35 minutes and they've gotten an incredible workout and blasted their body that's going to help them grow. Why? Because they've got a very set routine. They manage their environment. They've got very good habits of discipline. They've got a very good attitude not to get distracted and to allow other things to distract us. Why? Because they're focused on performance. They're focused on their own individual performance, and they've taken responsibility for their performance. And now when you start to take what I'll say responsibility for your performance, you become what I like to call self-managed, self-motivated individual. And when you become a self, a truly self-managed, self-motivated individual, meaning you don't allow outside influences to distract you, to interrupt you. They may come and impact on you, but you don't allow them to, what I'll say, disrupt you. They don't, you don't allow them to interrupt you. You stay to your focus from that point of view. You can, what I'll say, drive performance to an incredibly high level and ultimately smash results, okay? And I want to give you one last question or one last comment, one last situation, then we can open up for some questions where let's take the example for some of you, you may know, for some of you not know, that's fine, I'll fill in the gaps. Tom Brady, Tom Brady is probably the best, what I'll say, quarterback who's ever played in the NFL, okay? You've also got Aaron Rodgers, who arguably is a better talented quarterback than Tom Brady. He also plays in the in the NFL. They've had long established careers. Both of these gentlemen are going into the Hall of Fame. There's absolutely without a doubt that both of these gentlemen are going into what I'll say the Hall of Fame. Okay. Just let me go on that point. I'll back for a second. If we've got high inherent talent in a particular area, we've got what I'll say potential. We don't have performance that leads to results. What causes the talent to come out and lead to performance that leads to results, the effort and attitude we put into it, i.e. the habits and the opportunity, i.e. the system structure processes and culture and environment that we build for ourselves, that drives performance. Because here's where I'm going with it, okay? Both Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers have played, roughly speaking, about the same amount of time in the NFL. Through Aaron Rodgers' career, he has led his team to five championship games. By any standard, a very good result. By any standard, a very good result. A lot of NFL quarterbacks never even, what I'll say, lead their team to one championship, let alone five. Aaron Rodgers has done it five times. In those five games, he's won three of them. 
which has given himself the opportunity to compete for the Super Bowl three different times. Out of those three different times, he's won one. When you look at Tom Brady, Tom Brady has been to 15 championship games. Out of those 15, he's won 10 of them, which has meant he's played in 10 Super Bowls. And out of those 10 Super Bowls, he's won seven. Why? And what's the difference? Tom Brady focuses on performance, where Aaron Rodgers focuses on results. And it's so incredible that when you listen to them speak, when you read about them, when you see them on interviews, when you listen to how they respond to questions, Tom Brady is always talking about and always answering the question around performance. Aaron Rodgers is always talking about results. Okay, focus on results. You can be successful. Focus on results. Your mindset will go up when you get a good result. Your mindset will go down when you get a bad result. Focus on your performance. Your mindset will go high, will always stay high. And even when you don't produce the result, you still will walk away feeling very good about it. Why? Because you performed at a very high level. And the other thing is when you start to embrace that performance equation in your life, not only does your mindset go to a high level, your discipline goes to a high level. The quality of your effort goes to a high level. The quality of your life goes to a high level. Why? Because you are owning it and you're starting to live a life, what I'll call purpose-free. Okay? I'm just going to stop sharing right now for a moment and we can open that up to any kind of questions if anybody has questions or even comments. Oh. Hi, I think, uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, Bruce. I think, I think I've think i babbled a lot in the chat box already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have. You have, Martina, and thank you for um, that. But I, I like your comparisons, and I can relate to that. As a lifelong athlete, I look at performance. I also look at, look at it in terms of sports. Yeah. Um, but when we got into talking about habits, that definitely reminded me of um, you know, the, the seven, the seven habits, the book itself, um, and knowing what some of the top performers or some of the top CEOs and business owners, they have, they all have a very similar structure of their, of their day and how they start their day to keep them f focused, but also to still, as you said, seek how to understand others first before you want them to understand you kind of thing and giving back, not only asking of others, but also giving to others. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, they, you know, you, you work with executives at that level. They're very intentional with what they do. Why? Because they're focused on driving performance mm -hmm. and they under, and they understand what comes first. And, and as I said that, you know, performance comes before results and it does. If you look at that, you know, thoughts, efforts, and attitudes come before performance, mm -hmm. you know, and so are we thinking the right thoughts? Are we developing the right habit, uh, attitudes? Are we behaving in the right way? Are we, what I'll say, putting out the right effort to create the right habits that even allows us to perform at a very high level, given where our talent level is? Uh, Martina, too, playing athletics, you've probably seen it before, where you've played with somebody who's an incredible talent. But quite frankly, they're lazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, yeah. it, and it frustrates you so much. But then on the <laughs> other side, you see people who, you know, aren't as talented, but they work so hard. Yeah. And then you, get, then you get the people, again, like the Michael Jordans, like the Tiger Woods, like the LeBron James, who have that incredible talent and that incredible effort. And they just go to an incredibly high level. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they manage their own environment as well, too. It's like you've got to have all three pieces. And that's mm -hmm. why I say, you know, they're they're interdependent on each other. They're not independent of each other. And mm -hmm. so that's why it's the multiplication. So, you know, even yourself, Martina, if you did one thing to increase your talent, it's going to have an inordinate effect in your performance because it's going to have a spillover into your habits, going to have a spillover into your environment. If you uh -huh. start to create your environment that you want on purpose and really set up 
I'll say your work routine, your system structure process is the way you want. It's going to have a spillover effect into your habits. It's going to have a spillover effect into your talent. And therefore, again, overall, your performance will go up. It it really does, and um, that that as you're saying that 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 reminds me of you know you you have a, a positive or a negative feedback loop. Yep. So the more good things and positive things you do that make you feel good, they'll make you feel good in let's say if it's athletics or fitness, and you start your day with exercise, and that makes you feel good about yourself, and you've really accomplished something. You're literally physically feeling good and awake. And then that energy carries into your work life or your business day. And now you're Absolutely. feeling right, you're more productive, you're more focused. So you're Absolutely. getting more done. And then again, you're getting that positive feedback thinking, wow, I've just got so much done and did things that I've been putting off, but I had the energy to do them. And now I actually feel great for having done them. And it wasn't half as bad as I thought it was going to be. And then it just keeps going and you you sort of, you keep feeding yourself in that positive loop as well. Well, and then and that's where I call, because now you're onto what I call the flywheel effect, which now you're doing performance on a daily basis at a fairly high level. And mm -hmm. because of that, it's almost a flywheel effect that every day you do it, it keeps taking it to a higher and higher level automatically simply by just what you're doing. Yes, and, and all, all the, yeah. yeah, and all of a sudden you look back over the last six months and go, holy smokes, I can't believe how far I've come. You know, And this is where I kind of laugh when people say that they're not morning people. Um, everybody's a morning person. You just have to do it. And if you look at majority of highly successful people, they're up early and they have a very established routine for themselves, exactly to your point, to get the day off the way they want the day off intentionally. And yes. then because they've done it in the morning, the rest of the day goes, generally speaking, quite well. Where people who get up and yeah. they're kind of haphazard with their morning routine, a yeah. little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I don't really feel like doing that, and I don't really feel like working out today, it's a little cold, so I'm not going to go running. And then all of a sudden, they have average days at best and, and a lot of what I call mediocre days. Right, right. So it's basically it's taking it's taking control of our day and managing our day instead of letting the day manage us. Right. And going right back to what we were talking about today, you can control every aspect of your performance. You get to decide how you're going to perform. You get to decide what skills you work on. You get to decide what your habits are. You get to decide what your environment is. So you can literally manufacture and that's why I say when you start to really take responsibility for your performance, by default, you'll become incredibly self-managed and incredibly self-motivated. Mm. Okay. Why? Because you're intentionally making these decisions. And while we can't control results, we can very much influence them in our, what I'll say, favor. Why? By consistently performing at a high level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, Krista and Caesar, any comments, any feedback? If you want to unmute, by all means. If not, that's okay. And we can let everybody get on with their Friday afternoons. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say that, Bruce, I just love the way you, uh, you put out your presentations. I thought that was just excellent. I can relate to so many of the things that you talked about. And, uh, I'm just happy that I uh, tuned in and listened to you. Well, thank you, Caesar. Thank you very much for your very kind words. Uh, and Caesar, I'll say right back to you too. I, I love your I love your dedication. You're always on the calls. Um, you're always again so positive and get so much out of it. So thank you very much for supporting what we're doing with our Give to Get mission. Yeah, very good. Okay, perfect. Hey, huh? Bruce. It's Krista. Hi, and it Hi was, Krista. Hi, it's a great presentation. This has been, well, I've listened to um, a few that I've had to um, not, it wasn't direct. It, like this one is direct, listening to it direct. And this was wonderful. And I hopefully can do more of these. It was great as always talking with you and listening to your, the, I guess your mindset and the way you present things, it's uh, wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, we're having a lot of fun with the program. We're, we're building momentum each and every day, each and every week. Um, and quite frankly, we're just wanting to help support people, again, live that balanced life, balanced spiritually, balanced emotionally, balanced intellectually, balanced financially, um, and balanced physically. So thank you, everybody, for being on the call. I wish you all the best for a wonderful weekend with your family, and we'll see you on the program next week. Thanks very much. Take see care. you next week. Take Thanks, care. Bruce. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.